Hey there, and welcome back to XCOM 2. My name is Pete, and today we complete another episode of our Legend Iron Man walkthrough of XCOM 2 War of the Chosen. Last time we left off after an episode that saw a lot of progress, especially in the completionist department, with four achievements unlocked. However, it wasn't really the most action-packed episode. We had Dragonova solo an alien facility and that entire business took about five minutes. So to make up for that, today it's going to be all mission action for the entire video. We have sent out our team on a guerrilla ops mission to destroy a psionic transmitter. We have six turns to do so, but of course we can prolong that timer by disabling power relays. And to make the mission a bit more interesting, we have both a large number of explosives on the map as well as the lost present. A combination that is surely not going to cause any problems whatsoever. Now to get us started, we are sending Tsunami up onto the high ground, and as we do, we catch a brief glimpse of some enemy health bars. The target is marked. An alien patrol. And as Reaper Sleeper makes her move, she also spots them for good. A Codex, a Purifier and an Advent Trooper. All in all, nothing to be too concerned about just yet. Let's move up as close as we can with Julian. Maybe that allows us to trigger a good round of overwatches on the enemy turn. Our readings indicate that Relay is feeding energy directly into their network. If you can destroy it, it may disrupt their efforts to isolate the transmitter. Alright, so not only have we spotted our first power relay, but the Lost have also come into sight. So chances are that we'll be opening fire very soon here. I'm at your service. So let's get everyone into position, activate a few overwatches and see what happens on the enemy turn. And there we are, as I had planned, by moving forwards just one tile the enemies detect Julian. And so we can now begin this fight on our terms. Right, and with that the Codex is down, courtesy of Psy Operative Matt Lewin. You can never escape my sight. The Lost meanwhile also activate, but don't harm anyone just yet. Meanwhile we have a second group of enemies coming in from the left, but thankfully Tsunami has not yet used her reaction shot. They have a patrol moving here. I have sight beyond vision. Okay, so on our second turn, that is already five active alien enemies on the map, together with a handful of lost. Lost that do now get their turn, but mostly use it to just arrive on the scene. Unfortunately, it looks like as if for the moment they are mostly ignoring the alien enemies, which in turn, of course, does not make things any easier for us. Over on the right side here then it looks like at least one of the lost is attacking the trooper. But despite only having three hit points remaining it's not enough to take it out. So looks to me like this mission is already off to a lovely challenging start. Let's keep going by moving up with Reaper Selica who helps us paint a clearer picture of the enemies ahead of us. Over here we have a mech trooper, another purifier and an already injured priest. The two humanoid enemies are also already somewhat surrounded by lost so it might not be entirely necessary to take them out right here and now. As we move up with Julian though, it turns out that those lost were not yet active. Now they are, and thankfully it looks like they have chosen the closest enemies as their targets. Still, as long as we have guaranteed kills, we might as well use them. For our real action on this turn, we thankfully won't need ammunition. So at this point it's time to fire the plasma blaster for the first time. As you can see it fires in a relatively narrow straight line, but we are lucky enough to have a grand total of four enemies standing on that line. The plasma blaster also bypasses up to four points of armor, and we even get a kill with it against one of the lost here, which is important for an achievement. Moving on then we take out another lost with specialist Van Dyke. And using his implacable movement, we can get him into a position where he can now target the mech. And thanks to blue screen rounds, that is going to be another guaranteed kill. That sieht 
The mech also drops some loot, but for now we are not going to worry about that. Instead, let's clear out another lost with Grenadier Typhoon. And after reloading, he can then follow things up by decimating the armor of the Purifier. Despite the half cover, we have enough aim bonuses applied here so that the hit is guaranteed. At this point, we then switch things over to Zanami, who activates teamwork for Van Dyke. The enemy should fear us. And I think it is no secret what we're going to use that for, as Van Dyke is in the perfect position to deal the Purifier the killing blow. Jumping back to Zanami then, we first use her Dark Lance to take out the Brute over by the loot. And we follow things up with a shot against the Purifier right next to it. Unless we deal minimum damage, this should be another kill. Well done. As we had hoped, the network separation has been temporarily delayed. Now the Purifier unfortunately explodes, which on one hand draws in a lost swarm. However, it also just destroyed one of those power nodes, and so we have gained another turn. And we can actually gain ourselves another one by taking out the Lost and the Trooper over here, as we can hit them both with Void Rift from Matt Lewin, and the radius is just large enough to also take out another power node. Welcome to Void! They're toast! So, that leaves us only with two more visible enemies, and chances are they're going to attack each other, so we might as well finish the turn scouting ahead just a little bit further with our Reaper. I have the objective in range. That's a confirmed visual on the transmitter. Plant the X4 charges before they can cut it off from the network. The target is marked. We are too much for them. The priest then decides to spend their turn simply fleeing the action, and we also see an Archon in the shadows. However, no further enemies decide to show themselves, and so the single remaining Lost here simply decides to pursue the Priest. Just as we kill them, they send for more. And yes indeed, we have enemy reinforcements incoming. And the problem here is that they are pretty far away from some of our soldiers. However, moving those soldiers closer would of course also risk activating that Archon in the back. A few moves, however, we still have to make, for example, to grab the loot here, two hair triggers and an advanced conditioning PCS. I guess that'll be okay. With the rest of the squad then, we move up as far as we dare. Eventually though, our turn ends with everyone going on overwatch. No problem, boss. As long as we still have some lost on the map, I think our enemies should not be too concerned with us. My watch begins. Overwatch. Scaling on Overwatch. Mir entgeht nichts. For our reinforcements, then we have another purifier, a lancer, and a mech incoming. I have sights beyond the control is moving. Let's see how many reaction shots we can get off here. Okay, so unfortunately just the one, but that one a critical. Much more interesting, meanwhile, is what just appeared near the psionic transmitter. You can never escape my sight. This variation of the Archon must surely be the modified subject Dr. Valen had been experimenting on. She didn't have to upgrade their equipment in the process. No wonder these things escaped from the lab. And yes indeed, after the Viper King and the Berserker Queen, we are now meeting the Archon King. With 120 hit points and 5 points of armor, arguably the strongest of the alien rulers. His untimely presence is then backed up by another Archon, as well as by the three enemy reinforcements that just showed up. Not to mention the Advent Priest still sitting active at 9 hit points. So, at this point, our number one priority has to be to not enter line of sight with the Archon King. As long as we manage to do that, we will not trigger any ruler reactions. And technically, I think the Archon King has not even seen us yet, because the only one with line of sight is Reaper Sleeper. So as long as we completely ignore it and don't reveal ourselves, I think we should be fine. So first things first, let's get a few people in new positions where they are getting closer, but not too close. Jetzt komme ich. 
Should I double check that for you? And then we are laying down Typhoon Saturation Fire against the mech and the Stun Lancer. Now unfortunately the shot against the Lancer misses, but still it's better than just taking a single shot against the mech, not to mention that the Lancer's cover has still been destroyed, which should make things significantly easier in the future. Psy Operative Lewin meanwhile, equipped with the Bolt Caster, has an 80% chance of killing the heavy mech here, let's see if he can make that count. Alright, lovely, and that now allows Van Dyke to take aim at the Lancer, And after delivering 8 points of damage, Tsunami here is guaranteed the kill. You know that was good. Somewhat unexpectedly, but definitely not in the wrong moment, she also gets a free action off of the hat trigger. So let's use that to take a 97% against the priest, with just a bit of luck that results in another kill. Okay, just grazed him, which is unfortunate, and even more unfortunate is the risk that we are now taking with Julian, but Bombard is sadly the most reliable way of eliminating the Purifier. So this unfortunately just counted as two separate explosions, and that means we now have lost incoming immediately. Alright, so the map is looking nice and crowded. Normally I would say that the presence of Lost might actually work in our favor. After all, chances are that they will attack some of our enemies too. However, there is quite a lot of them, so let's start thinning out their numbers a bit with Reaper Celica. With 5 kills in the books, we can reposition a bit. And then we can take one more shot, a 97%er. The remaining shots available to her then are just a bit too risky, so we'll reload, and with that our turn is already over. And while the Archon thankfully decides to spend its action taking out one of the lost, the Priest is not so generous, and so Van Dyke becomes the target of a mind control. Thanks to double explosions, we also have another Lost Swarm appear on the scene. Thankfully, they once again pick the same spot as the one before, and so, at least for the moment, they are mostly threatening the aliens. As you can see, a few individuals are moving towards our position though, which is why I'm not really all that willing to rely on the Lost doing all the work for us. Still, we also have two brave souls lunging at the Archon King for a grand total of one point of damage. Another good reason why summoning the Lost here is really not that great of a weapon against it, as fun as it might seem in theory. So, once again, we are looking at a situation not unlike the one we had on the turn before, only this time we have no control over Van Dyke, so let's fix that first. With Julian here, we are going to activate Overdrive and then move him into a very carefully chosen spot. I hope you know where I'm going. A spot where he avoids detection from both the Archon as well as the Archon King. In that spot, we then activate his free Nova ability to take out two of the Lost, and unfortunately I had also hoped to take out the Priest, but as you can see it can't go through walls, which is curious considering that it can very much destroy them. Now this gives the Archon line of sight, but thankfully not the Archon King. And our turn is not done yet, so let's take out another Lost while we're here. Afterwards, we are then going to use Nova again, this time to take out the Priest. However, using it more than once will also cause Julian to take some damage. 
For now, it's only two points of damage and the mind control is broken, which now leaves us with one more shot to take against the Archon over here, an enemy that we definitely do not want to leave alive for too long. Right, and it looks like Julian did have line of sight on the Archon King after all, who therefore now gets a ruler reaction. This is admittedly somewhat curious, because the reaction should have triggered after shooting the Lost earlier too. Alas, it did not, and so the Archon King has now used his Devastate ability, a slightly more powerful version of Blazing Pinions, with the big caveat that it will trigger as soon as the next reaction is triggered. So even though it only targets the Lost for the moment, we want to be very careful about how we proceed here. That is also why for now we are staying put with Specialist Van Dyke and just have him take out a few more lost. At least until he runs out of ammunition. Moving up with Typhoon then does trigger a ruler reaction, but for the moment we can live with that. In fact, it might even make things easier for us, because for the moment at least the Archon King is only targeting the lost. And whatever is not killed is at least severely damaged, so while another swarm is due to appear soon, the one that is currently present at least should not be too difficult to deal with. My life is in your hands. With the group then somewhat decimated, Reaper Selica moves onto the high ground, while we send forth Matt Lewin, who triggers another ruler reaction. It's trying to grab one of our people. Don't let it take them. Now, this ability here is called the Icarus Drop. Essentially, the Archon King will spend a turn flying up into the air with a target, which will then be dropped down on the next turn, or ruler reaction, and this drop can deal up to 9 points of damage. Once again, for now a lost is the target, so we are not too concerned. So instead we take a lightning hand shot against a 9 hit point lost, and then take it out with a guaranteed headshot kill before we reload. Reloading is also what we do with Van Dyke before we then send the entire squad on Overwatch, which itself is considered an action and therefore triggers a ruler reaction. And after the Lost now perishes to the Icarus drop we officially end our turn, which allows me to briefly explain the big upside of forcing all of these ruler reactions early. The thing is, Icarus Drop and Devastate are the only two real abilities the Archon King has apart from shooting or striking something with his staff. And Icarus Drop has a 3 turn cooldown before it can be used again, the cooldown on Devastate is actually 5 turns. In other words, at least for the time being, the Archon King has completely wasted both of those abilities on the Lost and can now no longer use them against us. Obviously, this tactical advantage is somewhat negated by the appearance of two further Archons, although at least for now they stay out of sight. The last remaining Lost then also targets the Archon King and deals one more point of damage, and with that we are now down to four enemies, and that is most likely all that remains on this mission, unless of course we trigger another Lost Swarm. For the moment at least, we make sure not to trigger any further ruler reactions, if possible, and so we spend the turn mostly taking care of reloads. As long as we still have a single lost on the map, the Archon King has an easy target, and there is no need to make our life any more difficult than it already is. Now unfortunately, Van Dyke somehow establishes line of sight here and triggers a ruler reaction. And while the Archon King's attack only goes against the Lost, it does also advance the cooldown time on all of his abilities by one turn. So from this point onwards we need to be very careful. Now thankfully putting everyone but Van Dyke on Overwatch did not trigger any further reactions, and with the regular Archons up first, our Overwatches now also find their intended targets. Now 
That's how it's done. Alright, so once again it is Psy Operative Matt Lewin capping off a lovely round of reaction shots. Archon number 2, meanwhile, uses the entire turn to dash and does not attack us, while the Archon King, strangely enough, also does not do anything on the alien turn. And that to me is a bit confusing. After all, we did already reveal ourselves to him. Okay, I'll go. Still, this only works in our favor and we do have three turns left on the clock, so let's simply go on Overwatch again. And once again, it is the Archon that moves first, and I'm confident that out of six possible reaction shots, we should be able to take it down. Okay, so I have to admit, things are getting a little bit weird here. The Archon King not acting at all for two whole turns is definitely strange behavior, and I can only imagine that it has to do with us not having a direct line of sight to him. Nonetheless, I can't explain why he doesn't even want to move. Either way, the clock is ticking and we have a bit of a task ahead of us, because of course we had to save the Archon King for last and that means we now have quite a bit more to do here than to just kill him, so let's buy ourselves at least a little bit more time. Afterwards, moving in with a cloaked Reaper does of course not trigger a ruler reaction, and so we can now reposition Selica on the high ground, in theory in a perfect position to use Banish, but we don't actually want to do that. Instead, we will just attach one of her two claymores as a homing mine on the Archon King. This burden will cost you dearly. Thankfully, he is not going to notice any of that. Afterwards, we then once again go on Overwatch, just in case he now decides to move. As you can see though, that is not the case and that means the timer is once again where it was just one turn ago, only that now we have a homing mine ready and active. So at this point, our goal becomes to do as much damage as possible to the Archon King without triggering ruler reactions. So let's use a second claymore with Reaper Sleeper, this one however on the ground, since you cannot attach two homing mines at once. Grapple. Grappling in with Tsunami is then considered a free action and will therefore also not trigger a reaction. And the same is true for Lightning Hands, which we can now use to shoot the Archon. Not only will the shot bypass his armor, but also blow up the homing mine, which will then in turn blow up the claymore. And so we deal a good 18 points of damage and have the Archon King's armor completely removed. And you may have also just noticed that the explosion did not trigger a Lost Swarm, so we might have reached the limit of how many Losts can spawn on this mission. Either way, we are now using Typhoon to launch a grenade. Now, not only did we just destroy another power node, but very importantly, we also kept the Archon's cover mostly intact, just so he does not suddenly get line of sight to any of our troops. For that reason, we can now also safely move in with Mad Lewin without triggering a reaction. And afterwards, we are going for the first achievement of this mission, because Tsunami has the Serpent Armor equipped and thus has access to the Frostbite ability, and thanks to the high ground, it is guaranteed to hit. So, with that, we have now unlocked the Enemy Adopted achievement and the Archon King is frozen for two turns, which now allows us to take two actions without fear of repercussions, the first, a simple pistol shot. But the second will be a much more damaging use of Tsunami's rapid fire ability. Once again, both shots are guaranteed to hit and we will deal at least 16 points of damage. So, that's the Archon King, down to about half health already, but now also no longer frozen. Time to follow things up with another explosive, yes Typhoon can use two of these per turn, and this time we are going for the big blaster bomb for maximum damage. That's another 8 points of damage and again no line of sight, no reaction, and at this point we are going to freeze the Archon once more with a frost bomb from Matt Lewin. Now 
Now that freezes the Archon again, but this time only for one turn. However, one turn is all we need to get in with Julian and hopefully land a strike at 90%. And that connects, dealing 11 points of damage and bringing the Archon King down to a meager 47 hit points. And at this point, there is really not a whole lot more that we can or even want to do. So let's finish the turn by giving 8 protocol and consequently a threat assessment reaction shot to Zanami, before we then put Van Dyke and Selica on Overwatch to end our turn. Okay, so weirdly enough, even reduced to about one third of his hit points, the Archon King does not act. And obviously, for the sake of keeping our team safe, this works in our favor, but we really need him to perform at least one particular action. So let us now activate Overdrive on Julian and then simply shoot him. This guarantees a ruler reaction. Let's hope it's the one that we're looking for. And indeed, having taken enough damage, the Archon King has now opened up a psionic portal. And if we now give him just one more ruler reaction, he will use that reaction to use that portal and escape. And this is where things now get tricky, because we actually want him to do that, at least the running towards the portal bit. Of course, we do not want him to get away. What we do want to do to unlock another very elusive achievement is to kill the Archon King while he's attempting to escape. And to actually manage that, we now need to bring his health bar as low as possible without killing him. So, that's another 6 points off of Typhoon's final explosive, and of course, no reaction. And at this point, we are switching things back to Julian for Nova Hughes number 3 of the mission. And it says it right here in the description, consecutive Novas will damage the spark. In this case, Julian will be hit for a further 4 points, but Nova is entirely free, meaning no reaction. And, well, why do it once if you can do it twice? Both Julian as well as the Archon King still have a good number of hit points remaining. So let us now remove six more from both of them. Right, so that brings the Archon King down to 21 hit points, which I think is manageable to take down with a few well-placed reaction shots. However, a few of our soldiers have also already acted on this turn and we want to maximize our chances. And that actually includes revealing our Reaper, because only when she's uncloaked can Selica take a reaction shot. However, before we break stealth by planting the X4 charge, let's make sure that we do not get a nasty surprise as a reaction. So let us now use Psy Operative Luin to drop Stasis. As you can see, there is no hit chance, so it is guaranteed to work. And unlike the Frost Bomb, it will last for an entire turn. So that is the Archon King in Stasis, which means it can't act or do anything for an entire turn. And this time that means an entire turn, not just a ruler reaction. On the flip side, we also can't do any damage, but I think that's acceptable. Isolate the transmitter. Eliminate any remaining hostiles before they cut it off. So that's the X4 planted and our Reaper revealed, but we do not get a reaction because of stasis. And since stasis will last for the entire duration of our remaining turn, we can also safely reposition with Van Dyke here. Psy Operative Lewin can also get onto the high ground and then we finish the turn on Overwatch. So this time, the fact that the Archon King does not perform any actions on his turn is very much expected. At this point then, the moment of truth has arrived. As soon as we activate our next round of overwatches, that will trigger the next ruler reaction. And at that point, we need to hope that six reaction shots will be enough to take out the Archon King on his way to the portal. That transmitter is history. Good work, Commander. Rollin toughened them up some, but not enough to handle us. Good work out there, people. I am eager to begin examining the subject as soon as we can get it back to the lab. We might as well take advantage of Dr. Valen's existing experiments. 
as I have no intention of trying to replicate them myself. Commander, that's the last of them. Three botched science experiments, three alien rulers down for the count. At the very least, we know Valen is still out there somewhere, and we picked up some new gear in the process. Not a bad haul, considering. And there we go, that is the Archon King defeated too while he is attempting to escape. And as a result we unlock three achievements including the elusive not throwing away my shot achievement. And yes, this was indeed the last of the three alien rulers. And with all of them now out of the picture, the mission should become a bit more peaceful. By the way, it was obviously not only Mad Lewin who killed the Archon King with a single Overwatch shot, but the game can sometimes be a bit weird about not showing all the reaction shots, especially if they go off at the same time. I think we need more dead aliens to get the effect we're going for. Like jealous children, these radicals seek to strip us of the wondrous gifts provided by the elders. Though we might pity their ignorance, we will not allow such incursions to remain unchallenged. Today's setback is the prelude for tomorrow's victory. I expected something of a learning curve for our new recruits. But they've done a remarkable job, Commander. Well, that might be because Matt Lewin literally started his very first mission at the highest rank possible, and I am happy to report that he definitely delivered. Commander, on your order, I can begin conducting an autopsy on the latest of Valen's test subjects. We have an opportunity here to advance our own research beyond the bounds of our current expertise. We should begin as soon as possible. And indeed, with the Archon King Corpse recovered, we will once again have the opportunity to examine it closer. And you can probably already imagine what kind of items such an examination will yield. You have done an outstanding job leading the Resistance, Commander. And of course, let's not forget that all of this was in fact only a Gorilla Ops mission. We have now officially countered the Signal Jamming Dark Event, and we have recruited scientist Dr. Weston Graves. Nicknamed Anathema and submitted by Patreon supporter Uprooted Grunt, his biography reads as follows. Once a man of the cloth, Weston found himself forced into combat when the seminary he was teaching at was burned to the ground by the invaders. He proved to have a talent for both melee and ranged weapons and earned the nickname Anathema for his uncompromising attitude towards the invaders. And with that uncompromising attitude, he will now join our science staff Arguably one of the most important areas of operation that we have this late in the game, considering that in the engineering department we have unlocked pretty much everything already, while we still have a decent chunk of research still left to unlock. And of course, unlocking things, that is what we will continue to do in the next episode. For today, I think we have reached a good point to make the cut. I'll be honest, the way today's mission unfolded was definitely a bit weird. From the Archon King not taking actions on the enemy turn to the Lost not showing up as a result of explosions, things did feel a bit off, especially during the later turns. Still, I hope it doesn't diminish the success we had here today. Grabbing these achievements certainly wasn't easy, doubly so for doing it with the Archon King. So I hope that, despite XCOM being a bit strange at times, you still enjoyed the episode, and if you did, then I would be very happy if you could leave a thumbs up. Of course, as always, if you like what I'm doing and want to support me and my channel further, then you can go ahead and subscribe to stay up to date, grab some merch over on shop.petecomplete.com or check out and maybe even pledge to the Pete Complete Patreon. Thank you all for watching and I'll see you next time. Cheers.